Yeah. Ren, right. Okay. So this is my presentation, Aid in Counterinsurgency. Uh, I called it a light and dark. That is my title. My name is Ethan Ferguson, otherwise known as Bertie. So I will be going over my question, the methodology, the preliminary review, the public studies, my findings, and also the concerns. So the first is the big two, <laughs> the big question. So first, what is the purpose of my research? Uh, I've kind of subdivided into three different things. The first thing is to create a baseline knowledge of counterinsurgency operations, intelligence studies, and real-world application, how I can tie all these things together to provide sustainable solutions to war fighting problems. Um, second thing would be to understand not only the different ways that healthcare is utilized in hostile climates, but also the, to understand the practicality of the usage of uh, these different measures. Um, and lastly, to understand the effect that the provision of healthcare and humanitarian aid has on the war climate. And the war climate refers to the overall 360 degree view of conflict that includes the hostile actors, that includes coalition forces, that includes the civilian population. So I'm looking at the dynamic and the intersectionality of all these three, all these things. So my research question, it originally was, does the provision of healthcare and humanitarian aid have a positive effect on the rapport between US forces and the civilian population? The short answer is yes. There's a longer answer to that though. This is a very, this, this question has become much more broad the more I look into this topic because it, it includes so many different things. And this is just such a narrow, very narrow question and it just covers such a very, a very minute level of interactions, um, which we will get into later. So what is the significance of my project? Uh, two things. One is to bring attention to an under-researched and underappreciated aspect of modern war fighting and identify key variables that lead to more effective, sustainable, and humane solutions. And also to identify the importance of civil military operations and how the provision of healthcare and humanitarian aid by military forces could be paramount to minimizing human suffering. Um, to go off of that, um, when I say to improve civil military operations and also how it can be paramount to minimizing suffering is one thing that our military leaders seem to be more focused on nowadays is the aspect of material and personnel. Um, and I kind of got inspired by this by Rand Corporation did a study called The Will to Fight and it looked at why do humans approach conflict and have, what sustains their interest in conflict. Um, and one of the ways that we approach the will to fight or diminishing the will to fight is how many people can you kill and how many assets can you destroy. I want to shift this thinking to how can we provide enough support to a population that it shifts from how many things can we kill, how many things can we destroy to how can we even eliminate the want to fight? How can we provide enough support to where it just completely eliminates the problem altogether? So my methodology. Um, my proposed methodology uh, is exploratory. It is not very definitive. It is, I'm looking at a very broad spectrum of things. Uh, it is qualitative. There is not a lot of quantitative data out there about my, uh, what I want to research. And the interviews that I did are very purposeful. I, I was looking at a very direct sample pool, or a very small sample pool. Um, what are the limitations? Uh, I get limited viewpoints. Because this is so broad, that it would be impossible for me to interview and get enough people that cover all the different aspects of what I want to research. So the, what I did was I just researched uh, Special Forces personnel because of their direct interaction with the civilian population and how they utilize what I want to study. Most of the literature present already with my preliminary literature um, is reviewing encounters between Special Forces and MACD personnel and other humanitarian and non-government organizations and how they approach this issue. Um, it did not cover all aspects, as I said. Um, and it's also not enough to make change. The problem with this is very little evidence supports um, my research question. And that's kind of what I aim to do with my future research is to create this evidence and to highlight how it is useful. Preliminary uh, review of the literature. So there's a couple things that we need to know, and one of which is what is counterinsurgency? And that is a very hard question to answer, but for the sake of this, the National Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO, 
defines counterinsurgency as the comprehensive civilian and military efforts made to defeat an insurgency and to address any core grievances. This is the main thing. That is the most important part of that definition. So what core grievances are we talking about? There's three, there's really three different things, but this is my focus. There is political grievances, security, and economic grievances. And that is further compounded here by Kilcone's three pillars. So this is a rough overview of what counterinsurgency entails. So counterinsurgency, you have security, political, economic, and then security will cover how do we support military, how do we support the police structures within a state, how do we, and how do we provide security for that civilian population. Um, and what I am studying falls under the economic, where it says humanitarian assistance, and also development assistance, resources, and infrastructure throw into that as well. Um, but the overall goal of counterinsurgency is to increase the legitimacy of the state or the provincial government in the eyes of the civilian population. What we're doing is we're helping the civilian population. That is the goal. Um, and we do that by supporting these three pillars. Um, and really it's just getting them to support our cause over a illegitimate government or a terrorist organization or insurgency. Um, also, another way we can look at this is through the modified David Lula model. Um, this kind of gives you a really good visual of where my focus is at with my research. I am looking at this bubble here, the undecided population, the people that don't know who to support. Do they support the terrorist organization? Do they support us? I am a focus on here. And my focus for my research and my interviews were on special forces personnel and they work here in the back, in the gray. Um, and, but that is also very dynamic. I also look at the civilian affairs uh, aspect of it too with how we engage with our friendly forces as well as the undecided population. Uh, then I can also go into civil military operations and really what this um, model aims to show is that this is a big collaborative effort. This is not just done by the military. This is done, done by intergovernmental uh, organizations such as the United Nations, um, UNICEF, things of that nature, United Nations World Food Program. It's also done by non-government organizations, uh, Save the Children International Rescue Committee, doc uh, Doctors in Health, uh, Doctors of the World, and uh, Doctors Across Borders as well as another really good one. What else did I learn from the uh, preliminary research? Um, the provision of healthcare and humanitarian aid is not a new concept. This has been going on since Vietnam uh, with the introduction of the provincial health assistance programs, uh, military provincial health programs, and MedCAPs, so the medical civilian assistance programs. All of these were done um, and kickstarted by military personnel to try to diminish human suffering uh, during times of war. Uh, these operations are normally carried out by host nation forces, host nation civilian populace, special forces, and civilian affairs uh, specialists. Uh, and also that there is little to no re uh, literature that I've found that highlights how this aid was received that directly correlates to my research question, if that makes sense. Uh, these are my sources. I'll come back to that five times. And going on to my pilot study, the, the nuts and bolts. Uh, what I needed to do was I needed to create a foundational knowledge, so I did that with my preliminary study. Um, and I just needed to understand subjects such as counterinsurgency, how humanitarian aid and healthcare is currently being used, and also theories to how it could be improved. Uh, connections and outreach, this was extremely difficult because trying to find special forces personnel is notoriously hard and difficult, and even harder to even try to talk to them. And half the stuff you can talk about is classified, so it sucks. Uh, the interviews, I conducted two interviews, uh, one of which was used to really just create a foundational knowledge, and the other one actually really in depth to explore. Um, and then I also took these interviews and I cross-referenced it with the literature that was already present to see if I could find correlations um, between big data and then small occurrences. What did I learn? It is a logistical nightmare to try and provide humanitarian aid uh, in a war zone, surprisingly enough. Um, trying, to, trying to find the transportation, trying to allocate resources for these things and trying to provide it effectively is very difficult. Uh, the ability to provide is dependent on other factors, such as can we provide the security for the people that are trying to provide humanitarian aid? How can we ensure that they will be safe? Do we even have the resources? Um, 
how do we distribute these resources and how do we triage the people that we think could utilize these the best? Um, and also, do we even have the foothold within the region that would allow us to do this? Uh, provision and interaction does have a positive effect on the poor. Uh, what I did find is that it did, uh, which was really good to find. What else did I continue? This is contingent on us utilizing uh, a topic of, such as like ethnomedicine. So how can we use cultural medicine to better interact with this population? Because we cannot just go in there and just introduce Western medicine. It usually conflicts with cultural and religious ideas. Gender customs, you can't just walk into the Middle East and have a male treat a female, it doesn't work like that. So we also have to introduce logistics with, uh, such as introducing female medical practitioners and nurses and uh, medical technicians. Healthcare and humanitarian aid are not the only forms of affordability. We go in there and we build wells, we improve infrastructure, we do de-mining operations. There, I, one of my interviews told me of different uh, occurrences where they would intro, uh, hostile forces would put mines inside of schools and courtyards and hospitals, so they'd have to go in there and take those out. Also, eating their food and sleeping where they sleep and interacting with them on a regular basis within their cultural setting. And what else? Working through the provincial government, we have to work through them. We cannot be the ones providing this. We have to assist the provincial government in doing this. Give them the resources, give them support and training, and let them conduct their mission. Our role must be as an assistant. Also, we cannot be there forever. As we saw with Afghanistan, we cannot be the sole provider, and we also cannot be there forever. We have to withdraw at some point, so we have to give them the resources necessary to do so. Concerns, classification of material, half the literature I wanted to see was behind huge paywalls of hundreds of thousands of dollars, or it was just straight up classified and I couldn't see it. Uh, scarcity of sampling, special courses, very hard to come by, very harder to talk, much harder to talk to. Uh, offset, I can't get into the nitty gritty of a lot of their deployments just because it violates operational security. Um, so it could put them in danger or others. There. Good job. Right. 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 All right, questions.